Well, great. It's my, my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ray Chung. Ray is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and chief of hepatology at Mass General. Uh, I've been uh, very fortunate to work with him on the ASLD IDSA guidelines for hepatitis C. Uh, and he's going to be talking today uh, about hepatitis C, arc of a triumph. Ray? Thank you so much, uh, John, uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, and thank you all for, for inviting me out to uh, to speak to uh, to you this morning. Um, I also want to give a shout out to the Viral Hepatitis Interest Group uh, uh, and and its uh, leadership for uh, for rolling in an invitation to to meet with uh, them as well. Um, so this is a, a dual purpose a, a, a trip and, and journey, and it's been great to uh, catch up with uh, with the members of that group, including. Steve Poliak and, and uh, Michael Gale and, and uh, John, uh, as, as well as, as Scott Biggins and others. Um, uh, my task this morning is really uh, to be a correspondent, a correspondent from the front lines to describe really a tale of, of exceptional uh, uh, success. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, complete successes in many diseases, but, uh, but in the case of hepatitis C, I, I think uh, this is a, a notable uh, exception, uh, and it's and it's it's really a tale of of uh, cooperation between uh, scientists, virologists, uh, uh, and clinicians alike in terms of delivering uh, what is now curative therapy uh, to what amounts to millions of patients uh, worldwide, and and a, a a real strategy to think about elimination uh, of this uh, disease. Uh, these are my disclosures, and and I thought well, we'd start by uh, defining the scope of the problem as it, as it stands in, in 2018. The World Health Organization has estimated that, that at least 70 million persons are infected with uh, chronic hepatitis C worldwide, and that translates to about 3 million or so persons infected uh, here in, in the US. Perhaps what's more important is that, is that attributable mortality to hepatitis C uh, long ago, over a decade ago, eclipsed that attributable to HIV infection. And in fact, HCV-related mortality it exceeds the combined mortality due, due to uh, all other major infectious diseases uh, 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 combined. Uh, uh, le it is the leading indication for liver transplantation uh, worldwide and, and is the leading cause of hepatocellular carcinoma here uh, in the United States. Uh, as you can see here, the U.S. Um, uh, is, is representative in that it has a seroprevalence rate of, of somewhere between 1 and 2 percent, uh, and that is true of, 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 of much of, of the world. There are some hotspots that are noteworthy, including Egypt, where public health practices to uh, treat patients for schistomiasis, schistosomiasis, excuse me, uh, went awry in terms of uh, the sharing of needles to deliver those, those treatments. And one health problem was traded in for another, namely the acquisition of hepatitis C in much of that uh, population. Um, but as I said to you earlier, about 25 plus years ago, uh, an intensive molecular cloning effort led to the description of, of a new virus previously known as the elusive non-A, non-B hepatitis virus, the principal cause of transfusion-related hepatitis, uh, uh, molecular virology uh, efforts uh, led by scientists at the Chiron Corporation led to the description of the structure of, of what is now known as hepatitis C. It is a member of the flavivirus uh, family, uh, whose cousins include dengue, West Nile, and more recently Zika virus, uh, and as a simple genomic organization as shown here. Uh, it is a long uh, uh, 9400 nucleotide RNA that encodes a single long polyprotein, which is cleaved into 10 mature peptides shown here. The upstream portion of which is concerned with structure, namely the core and two envelope glycoproteins, and the downstream portion of which is, is really non-structural, or that is to say concerned with replicating the viral genome itself. These include the NS3 serine protease function and its cofactor NS4A as well as the NS5A, 5B RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which catalyzes direct copying of the RNA genome into new RNA strands. There is a third protein here called NS5A, which is not enzymatic in nature, but, but actually is essential for both replication and, and likely as well for um, a virus uh, assembly. So it is these three non-structural proteins that have formed the most intensive focus for therapeutic drug discovery. The NS34A protease, the NS5B polymerase, and the NS5A protein itself. Um, uh, and, and they will be the basis for the discussion of, of, of the therapeutics uh, program that, I, that I'll spending uh, most of, of this morning speaking about. Within the NS5B inhibitor, inhibitor class are both NUC inhibitors, which bind the active side of the polymerase and cause premature chain termination 
of the growing viral RNA, uh, or non-nuke inhibitors, which induce conformational changes in the NS5B polymerase itself, thereby limiting access of new nucleotides to that viral RNA chain. So no discussion of the virus uh, and, and, its, and its, uh, its, its successful treatment would be complete without a consideration, at least a brief consideration, of the viral life cycle as we understand it. And so here uh, is in cartoon form is, is a representation of how the virus uh, enters the cell, likely through the action of multiple co-receptors, which include, among others, CD81, uh, uh, scavenger receptor B1, and, 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 and others, um, uh, where upon the, the viral uh, RNA, um, after a membrane fusion event, um, becomes uncoated and, and is delivered naked in the cytoplasm uh, to ribosomes, where that RNA is then translated into a long polyprotein that I just showed you a moment ago, then processed by both the host protease function as well as as uh, as well as the virally encoded protease into those peptides that I, I showed you. These peptides then assemble on an altered endoplasmic reticulum membrane uh, uh, to form really essentially a, a an organized structure um, known as the uh, replication complex, which carries out uh, the replication of that the genomic RNA strand into anti-genomic strands, minus strands, which in turn are then copied back into plus strands. There is no DNA intermediate, so this is not a retrovirus. There is no stable latent form of, of this virus. You'll note here that the nucleus is untouched. All of the action is taking place in the cytoplasm. So, so in other words, this virus must replicate or perish. And that is its Achilles heel, which we'll revisit a, a little bit later on. Um, so, uh, the, once the new RNA strands are formed, uh, they then couple with the structural proteins to form um, a mature virions, which are then processed through the ER and Golgi, and then depart the cell uh, through exocytosis only to infect new target uh, cells. So as you can imagine, inhibitors affect discrete steps in this life cycle. The NS3, 4A protease inhibitors affect polyprotein processing. The NS5B uh, polymerase inhibitors clearly affect uh, RNA strand copying. Um, the NS5A inhibitors, as I suggested earlier, work uh, both on replication, where the NS5A is an intimate member of that complex, but as well on virus uh, assembly. So you get kind of a, a, a double bang for your buck uh, when it comes to using that class of inhibitors. But the NS5B polymerase, it should be noted, is uh, noteworthy for being an error-prone polymerase. That is to say, it fails to correct its own mistakes. And so with every replication cycle, at least one nucleotide is, is miscopied or misincorporated. That has led uh, with 10 to the 12 copying events in each person each day. You can imagine that there is an, an error in every one of those 9,400 nucleotide positions. And therefore, extraordinary diversity gets generated within an infected person. And that's been characterized by this phylogenetic tree, which shows us the diversity described worldwide in terms of genotypes, which are the major branches of this phylogenetic tree. And within those, uh, those types, subtypes. And so uh, you can have subtypes, again, within each of the six major uh, genotypes. The, uh, the, the magnitude of diversity here is, is breathtaking. That is to say, if you compare genotype 1 uh, sequences with genotype 3 sequences, you'd see a 30% amino acid difference, virtually different viruses. And in the early days of therapeutics, when we used interferon-based regimens, that translated into very differential response rates to those regimens. Uh, in, in the U.S., where genotype 1 and, uh, predominates in about three-quarters of patients, uh, that translated to very diminished response rates, less than 50%. Whereas genotypes 2 and 3, which will, will constitute the lion's share of the remainder of, of infections, uh, 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 were associated with response rates that were much better, about 80%, uh, percent, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. But it's not the virus that's responsible for the disease, and it's worth remembering that the disease that is the enemy clinically in hepatitis C, of course, is progressive liver disease, progressive liver fibrosis. And that is, again, due not so much to the virus, but to the, the immune response, the host response that it evokes. And, and in this particular instance, the, the dramatis personae here are the CD8 positive cytolytic T cell, which of course is recognizing virally infected cells who present viral peptides at the cell surface in conjunction with HLA class one molecules, and then bring about their clearance through programmed cell death or, or apoptosis. Uh, this is aided and abetted by CD4 T cell help. Um, and in the instance of, of, of a unsuccessfully cleared infection, which is true in most cases of hepatitis C, uh, we are left with essentially a smoldering infection in which both of these cell types elaborate cytokines which, uh, which contribute to pathogenesis. Uh, insofar as they activate an endogenous in, uh, um, uh, cell population in the liver known as hepatic stellate cells, which in health are vitamin A storage depots, but when activated become myofibroblasts. 
And those fibroblasts elaborate collagen into the hepatic sinusoidal space and lead to the phenotype we call fibrosis, which it could, of course can eventuate in cirrhosis. They also act through intermediate cells like macrophages, like Kupfer cells in the liver, which in turn uh, produce pro-fibrogenic cytokines like TGF-beta only to foment the process further. So this is the enemy. The enemy is this process that is not handled at the initial infection because of the predilection to chronicity, and this process smolders on for many years so that one is left with a natural history that looks something like this, in which we find over a period of decades, the progression of liver disease, chronicity being the rule in about 80% of cases, uh, uh, variably progressive courses, but in at least 20% of cases, and with long-term follow-up, we're seeing that that number is likely considerably higher than that at least 20% of cases march on to irreversible fibrosis known as cirrhosis. And of course, once cirrhotic, uh, there could be progression to uh, the feared clinical outcomes of decompensation, death from liver failure, need for liver transplantation, and an independent risk for hepatocellular carcinoma at a rate of about 1% to 4% annually among cirrhotics. This plays out over 20, 25 years with very wide confidence intervals and is aided as an accelerated by certain factors like uh, heavy alcohol use, uh, as well as HIV co-infection, which likely compressed this natural history by a factor of 50% of, of or more. So in terms of treatment, uh, we've come a heck of a long way back from the early 1990s when we were really roaming the wilderness uh, with what was essentially uh, a monochromatic approach to treatment of, 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 of this infection. We were treating patients with the antiviral cytokine known as interferon. Uh, interferon induces hundreds of host genes, which uh, themselves uh, act uh, against viruses by knocking down both viral RNA and protein synthesis, but create a host of other problems, as we'll discuss in just a moment. But you could see here that, that, that courses of 6 to 12 months of giving interferon alone three times a week, it was a long run for a short slide, 5 to 10 percent or 15 percent rates of, of sustained virologic response, which was clearance of HCV RNA say 12 or 24 weeks after completing any course of therapy. We, we improved our condition more by adding in the, the nucleoside analog known as ribavirin, which is, yes, a nuke analog and does have modest antiviral effects, but it's more likely acting to uh, aid and abet uh, interferon's uh, own effects. Uh, and so here we were able to boost responses in the 35 to 40 percent range, pegylating the interferon by allowing once weekly dosing by adding a polyethylene glycol molecule to reduce its clearance, led to further improvements so that of treated patients who finished treatment, uh, we were able to get a, eclipse the 50% uh, uh, plateau with uh, 12 months of therapy. And that was that took us into the early part of, of um, this century. Now, before I get into uh, the bad news, there is one important um, uh, 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 piece of good news that we learned from the interferon experience. Namely, that a sustained response, clearance of HCV RNA uh, 12 or 24 weeks after completing a course of therapy, was truly sustained. So if you did long-term follow-up studies of patients uh, up to seven years out after completing a course of therapy, regardless of your treatment group or population, uh, when you surveyed their HCV RNA that many years later, they remained virus negative, viral RNA negative, uh, consistent with the idea that we can achieve clinical cure of these patients. So even with imperfect regimens, we were still able to get many of them over the hump to clinical cure. Again, exploiting that Achilles heel that if you suppress replication long enough, you can achieve extinguish or extinction of the viral infection. The other good news has come with long-term follow-up of those patients. The question being, does that translate into clinical benefit? And so this study, among others, uh, followed patients who are most likely to have clinical outcomes, namely patients with advanced fibrosis. These are patients with fibrosis stages in the, in the pre-serotic to serotic range, right? So they were most poised to develop those decompensating events um, more liver-related mortality or the need for liver transplantation. And you can see here on the right panel that those patients with, uh, those 500 or so patients with this stage who are offered interferon-based therapy and followed up for about eight and a half years, uh, those who experienced sustained response did markedly better in terms of those outcomes than those who failed to achieve that response among this group of patients. Indeed, it was also associated, this group was also enjoyed benefits in terms of all-cause mortality compared to their, uh, uh, their, 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 um, their compatriots who failed to achieve sustained response. So clearly, achievement of virologic cure is associated with clinical benefit. That much we have learned from the interferon experience with long-term follow-up. But the bad news, as you might imagine, is that, is that there are lots of, of, of warts and collateral damage when it came to use of interferon-based regimens. Because of it, it's a potent cytokine, there is a cytokine storm-related set of AEs. 
including uh, neuropsychiatric uh, AEs, depression, anxiety, uh, among others. Cytopenias of all stripes, uh, including with ribavirin hemolytic anemia. Provocation of autoimmune events, either for those who already had autoimmune conditions or, or de novo autoimmunity uh, provoked in this context. So there are plenty, therefore, absolute and relative contraindications to moving forward with interferon-based therapy for many of our patients. And the, and the promise of therapy was therefore elusive to not just many, but most of our patients. Indeed, only 20% of the epidemic in this country was ever offered a therapy with interferon-based regimens. So the challenge for us was really to find more tolerable regimens, because we, from, from an effectiveness standpoint, we were making very little impact uh, on our, our patients. So that returns us back to the molecular virology revolution and what and the dividends that it has wrought, well, which is to say the discovery of these small molecules from a number of different classes to be put into patients to see if we could test the notion that we could achieve a cure of these patients in the absence of interferon. So this is the scorecard of those classes of inhibitors. I won't spend much time on it except to say here that, that they have all, uh, uh, with, uh, with improvements in, in structure and design, have become increasingly potent and increasingly pangenotypic to work on not just genotype uh, uh, one, but, but, but across uh, all genotypes. The original pangenotypic inhibitor was the NS5P polymerase inhibitor of the nucleotide class. That's because the, the active site of the polymerase is extraordinarily conserved between genotypes. And, and the ability of the virus uh, to mutate around that, uh, that, that structure le leads to significant crippling effects on, on vir viral fitness. So in, in vivo, uh, resistance mutations to this class are, are uh, extremely rare. In fact, um, really not, uh, have not been uh, clinically described. So a high barrier to resistance uh, because uh, they're, they're nucleotides, uh, they're not metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, though, so their drug interaction potential is also minimal. Uh, we've seen great improvements in NS3 protease inhibitors, which are now in, in, uh, pangenotypic. Uh, they have lower barrier to resistance, as do the NS5A inhibitors, again, also uh, having been developed into more pangenotypic uh, versions. Um, we have really not used non-nuke inhibitors um, uh, because of their very low barrier to resistance uh, and, and, and they have largely fallen off the map as, as a, uh, a class. But the first demonstration that, this, uh, that these direct acting antivirals, as they're called, uh, could, could make serious uh, hay when it, when it came to our patients was demonstrated a number of years ago uh, with the original uh, protease inhibitor known as telaprevir, and that's shown here essentially given uh, within 48 to 72 hours of oral administration of telaprevir monotherapy, we saw three to four log reductions, profound reductions in HCV RNA levels in these patients dosed for 14 days. You'll note uh, in two of the dosing groups here that there was a rebound of virus during that 14 day period. And if you actually sequenced virus there, you, uh, you found protease inhibitor resistant variants. And if you went back to the pretreatment uh, samples, they were often found in the pretreatment samples, suggesting that, that, that resistance already existed in these patients, but was merely selected out uh, under the pressure of, of treatment. So monotherapy uh, with these, these, these inhibitors was not going to be a starter. We were going to have to revert to, to other, other strategies. Um, and that strategy was essentially tethering, at least in the, in the case of the first class of protease inhibitors, of direct antivirals uh, to the backbone of peganiferin and ribavirin. So uh, it was an imperfect solution, but, but, but did jack up our response rates from that 55% to about 75 to 90%, depending on the direct acting antiviral that you coupled the interferon to. So we did make progress, but we still weren't there in terms of freedom from interferon. So the, 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 the real breakthrough came when we had now two or more classes to work with. And, and here we were borrowing a page from the HIV therapeutic playbook in which we could basically take members of different classes, which would be predicted have different resistance profiles that were non-overlapping. And so the strategy here would be, again, to take different classes, apply them, apply intensive uh, antiviral uh, uh, effects, uh, uh, but achieve the twin goal of preventing selection of resistant variants at the same time. And so that would be the, the, the premise here of combining two or more classes of, of direct acting IRL agents. So once the second class came out, we had the opportunity to really investigate this, uh, this, this concept in patients. And so I wanna share with you the data that, that, that really, um, have, um, really created the extraordinary explosion of activity in, in development of antivirals for hepatitis C. So the first such study was really the combination of a protease inhibitor called simiprovir with a new polymerase inhibitor known as sofosbuvir. 
right? And so, so two different classes were combined with each other, in this case given with or without ribavirin, uh, in genotype 1 patients um, who, had, who fell into one of two groups. On the left, you looked at these were patients who we would consider hard to treat. They were prior non-responders to interferon-based regimens. They had limited fibrosis stage. Uh, and the second group was a group of patients uh, who um, uh, had advanced fibrosis, bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis, and had either been treatment naive or non-responders to prior interferon. So these were the toughest groups of patients that, that, that we could assemble at that point in time. They were offered this 12 or 24 weeks of this all oral regimen. And you can see here, with, with, uh, with few exceptions, that, that we saw that, that the sustained virologic response rate eclipsed 93% across all groups, whether one got 12 weeks or 24 weeks, whether one got ribavirin or not. So this was the first demonstration that we could achieve cure, sustained virologic response in persons without dosing interferon. So this was a, an extraordinary uh, advance and, and, and demonstration that the proof of concept actually did hold. Uh, and so the floodgates were opened, and now all classes were, were, uh, were, more classes were introduced and combined with one another. In this case, uh, uh, this was a phase three trial combining sophosphere, the nuke inhibitor, with lodiposphere, an NS5A inhibitor. And this was done, in, again, in genotype one uh, patients who were treatment naive, 15% uh, of whom were cirrhotic. And again, 12, a similar study design, 12 or 24 weeks, with or without ribavirin. And you can see here that, that the results across the board were extraordinary. 98 plus percent, or 97 to 98 percent plus rates of sustained virologic response with as little as 12 weeks of therapy and not requiring a ribavirin. The same was true for treatment experience patients. These were folks who had failed peg interferon based regimens uh, previously. They too uh, could, could achieve nearly comparable rates of sustained response. Again, 12 or 24 weeks, uh, 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 achieving 95 plus percent rates of sustained response, um, uh, again, uh, in, with or without uh, ribavirin. Uh, so uh, this was uh, then prompted the question of whether if we could achieve success rates uh, with 12 or 24 weeks, could we shave off duration even further? And that led to a trial of, of uh, looking at duration of sophosphere and lodiposphere, that same nuke and NS5A combination, either with or without ribavirin for eight weeks compared to 12 weeks uh, without uh, ribavirin. And you can see here that, that, that overall, the top line results suggest that, that you could achieve comparable rates of response, in this case, 93 to 94% uh, to, to the 12 week regimen, giving eight weeks in this particular instance. But a post hoc analysis of these patients, uh, looking at their entry viral load, suggested that if you had a lower viral load coming into this treatment naive trial, and these were non serotic patients, um, uh, you had uh, uh, you could you could experience uh, uh, exceptional rates of response whether you got eight or twelve weeks. In contrast, those who started with higher viral loads uh, did not do so well. Their relapse rates were considerably higher in the eight week arm compared to the twelve week arm. So out of that uh, emanated the recommendation that we could offer selected groups of patients who were treatment naive, non serotic, uh, and had low viral loads in entry uh, to as, as as little as eight weeks of treatment with sofosphere and lodiposphere. Uh, other antiviral agents started coming online not long after sophosphere lodiposphere. Uh, this was a, a new combination that looked at an NS5A in the, called albosphere with a protease inhibitor known as grizopavir. And this combination was tested in genotype 1, 4, and 6 infected patients. And again, you'll see the story is largely the same. For 12 weeks of therapy, uh, these patients uh, enjoyed uh, nearly uh, or in excess of essentially of 95% rates of, of sustained response, uh, particularly in gene types one and four. The numbers of patients in G with gene type six were very limited in this, in this uh, study. So, uh, so using a PI plus NS5A approach can be quite successful, again, in this group of patients. And this too was approved as an FDA-based regimen. You'll notice that all of the, the studies I've, sh I've shared with you so far have been centered around gene type one. And that's because, of course, that's where the, the epidemic lies. 75% of patients, as I suggested to you, had, had genotype 1, and they were the ones least responsive to interferon-based regimens previously. Much of the cell culture models that were instrumental in developing these antivirals were also uh, based on genotype 1 uh, infection. Uh, so, uh, so not surprisingly, the question then became, with the advances in genotype 1, had we left genotypes 2 and 3 behind? So the question there then was, could we take some of what we had already developed here and, and, and bring it to, to positive use in genotype 2 or 3 patients. 
remember that sofosbuvir, one of the first agents introduced, was pangenotypic. So it was introduced to genotype 2 and 3 infected patients, who remember had much better rates of response to interferon in the old days, uh, and, and asked whether uh, we could bring them clinical benefit as well. So this trial compared the old PEG and ribavirin standard to sofosbuvir and ribavirin. So a single DAA combined with ribavirin to see if we could treat genotype 2 and 3 successfully. They were offered 12 weeks of therapy, and what you'll see here in the red is that it's really a tale of two genotypes, that there are really differential responses. Genotype 2 patients did very well, 97% rates of response. In contrast, those with genotype 3 didn't even surmount 60% rates of response. So uh, we need to be splitters rather than lumpers when it comes to thinking about genotypes 2 and 3 uh, infection. So that led to a question, well, if 12 weeks didn't do the job for these patients, can 24 weeks extending therapy do, do uh, that job? So this study essentially um, uh, conducted in Europe a phase three study um, known as the valence trial, uh, sought to ask whether uh, extending to 24 weeks of therapy with sofosterone and ribavirin could improve the lot of patients with gene type three infection. Uh, so this was actually an original gene type two and three study. So those patients uh, uh, with three were then offered 24 weeks. Those with two were offered 12 weeks. About 20% of patients in this group were, were cirrhotic and, and, and about 60% treatment experience. Now focus your attention on the red bars, which indicate genotype three infection. And you'll see here that the overall response rate and particularly in the non-cirrhotic patient response rate was excellent, 91% among those patients who didn't have advanced uh, fibrosis. But if you look at cirrhotic patients with gene type 3, that response really dropped off. 68% of gene type 3 cirrhotics still really, uh, at this point now, weren't really cutting it um, um, because we're now used to seeing 90 plus percent rates of response for the population. That's become our new expectation. So the next question was whether we could apply perhaps two classes of DAAs. Uh, another NS5A inhibitor known as Declasvir did demonstrate some in vitro activity against genotype 3. So the logical question was, could we combine that uh, NS5A inhibitor with sofosbuvir, the pangenotypic nuke inhibitor, to see if we couldn't get some of these, these uh, recalcitrant patients over the hump. So this was offered for 12 weeks in, in treatment-naive or treatment-experienced patients, about uh, 20 or 25 percent of whom had cirrhosis. And the overall sustained response rates look pretty good. Uh, and if you break them down, again, it's a non cirrhotic population shown here, superb, 96%. But again, if you go to the cirrhotic population, the fibrosis stage four patients, once again, they hovered around 60%. So we still, even with two DAA classes, these two, we still weren't making headway, getting traction on, on these gene type three cirrhotics. Uh, uh, so that leads us now to the introduction of these so-called pangenotypic agents that, uh, that have now combined a potent pangenotypic NS5A inhibitor, in this case with sofosbuvir. This regimen uh, was, uh, was uh, trialed in, in patients across genotypes, and this trial called uh, Astro-1 offered against genotypes 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 patients. And you'll see here that the sustained response rate for this 12-week reg week regimen was outstanding, 97 to 100 percent rates of response. Uh, uh, you'll note that, that a, a couple of uh, that gene type three was left out, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So, a separate study called Astral Two compared the same regimen, sofosbuvir and velpatisvir, a pangenotypic NS5 inhibitor, with that old sofosbuvir and ribavirin regimen that we had saw, seen successful uh, against genotype two. And here we saw uh, a modest but statistically significant improvements in the rates of response uh, in genotype 2 patients receiving, receiving SOF and VEL compared to sofosbuvir and, and ribavirin. Um, uh, and, and so this has now become the standard of care for genetic, genotype 2 infected patients. Those benefits were seen across both treatment naive and treatment experienced uh, uh, patients. Um, so uh, so we've, we, we've, we've really uh, made great headway in, in genotype 2. Uh, what about gene type 3, you ask? Well, so this was this, uh, a separate trial, phase 3 trial, of the same regimen, of hostrovopatosphere, given for 12 weeks in gene type 3 infected patients, known as uh, astral 3. And, and you want to focus your attention on the purple bars. Uh, they were compared against sofosbuvir and ribavirin for 24 weeks. And what you can see here is that, is again, that, that, that non cirrhotic patients did very well, 98, 91 to 98% rates of response based on, on treatment experience or treatment naivete. But among cirrhotics, for the first time, we saw significant headway in, in these gene type 3 patients, whether they were treatment naive or treatment experienced, approaching 90% rates of sustained response. So we we're finally making that kind of headway with this, uh, uh, this really uh, stubborn group of, of, of patients.
Turns out another pangenotypic regimen was also introduced at about the same time. This was called glucaprovir, uh, a protease inhibitor with pibrentisvir and an S5A inhibitor. Pangenotypic, highly potent uh, uh, regimens uh, given in this case in genotype 3 patients uh, for 12 weeks um, uh, compared to sofosphere and ducladosphere. Uh, this is a NUC inhibitor plus an NS5A inhibitor. And, and, and also looking at an eight-week regimen of glucaprovir and pibrensifer, otherwise known as a GP. So exceptional rates of response seen across the board in this non-serotic group of patients with genotype 3. So uh, a separate study evaluated GP in uh, more difficult to treat genotype 3 patients, and these are patients who, uh, a number of whom had not just cirrhosis, but also were uh, treatment experienced. And, and uh, these patients were offered either 12 weeks or 16 weeks of glucaprovir and probenosphere. You can see here that, that, uh, that the sustained response rates were, uh, were excellent uh, in non-serotic patients, but if you focus your attention on the serotic group shown here on the right, and particularly treatment experienced, 16 weeks of therapy uh, got 96% of those patients uh, through to sustained virologic response. So clearly we now have de developed an armamentarium to work on our most difficult uh, uh, groups of, of, of patients. But there's still yet other patient populations who never benefited from therapy with, with interferon-based regimens uh, that, that, um, that, that still uh, uh, remained to be treated. And so we asked about these patients in separate studies. Uh, mo noteworthy among this group of patients were those with uh, decompensated cirrhosis. Those patients who had slid off that natural history curve now had child B or child C cirrhosis uh, with jaundice, uh, uh, ascites, esophageal varices, et cetera. So this was the, the, the result of, of a study of sophosphere and lodiposphere in this group of patients. Uh, they were offered uh, uh, soft lodiposphere with ribavirin given at low doses uh, with, uh, with dose escalation as tolerated of the ribavirin for either 12 or 24 weeks. Keep in mind that these patients uh, cannot receive interferon-based regimens. It is, they are contraindicated because of interferon's risk for hastening further decompensation. So this was really their only option in terms of any type of an agent. So patients with genotype 1 and 4 with decompensation, either child class B or child class C, were offered these treatments. And what you will see here is that whether they got 12 or 24 weeks, we saw upper 80s to 90% rates of sustained response in this exceptionally sick group of patients. And if you look at this further in terms of looking at their, at their changes in, in function, liver function, particularly as reflected in the MELD score or in their albumin levels, we see here that, that improvements in MELD score shown here in blue bars were seen in about two-thirds to three-quarters of patients receiving uh, uh, treatment with sophosphorylid lodiposphere ribavirin, um, whether they were child B or child C. Only a small number of patients experienced increase in their MELD score during the course of, of therapy. So most patients experience clinical improvement or stabilization on treatment, which is, which is really an exceptional uh, finding. Correspondingly, we saw improvements in albumin levels in these patients in, in those who received um, uh, some phosphorylodiposphere and ribavirin. Remember, this is a very sick group of patients. There were still some deaths re, uh, reported, but um, again, there was no control group, but we would have expected to see some AEs, SAEs, including those described here in this, uh, this study. But largely, these patients experienced improvements in their clinical status. What about HIV co-infected patients? This is a group that, that failed to respond to interferon-based regimens to any meaningful degree, and, so were there, and, and have hastened natural history of their hepatitis C-related liver disease. So this was clearly an unmet need group, and when we offered sofosphere and lodiposphere for 12 weeks in this group, we saw remarkably, whether treatment naive or experienced, cerotic or non-cerotic, 95 plus rates of sustained response in this group of patients. The rising tide has lifted all boats when it comes to the application of directly acting antiviral <laughs> therapy in these patients. And uh, if that wasn't enough, uh, kidney failure patients couldn't receive uh, peg interferon ribavirin because of intolerance and ribavirin being renally cleared. Uh, they were now offered uh, Elbosphere and Grosopovir, neither of which is renally cleared. Uh, and, and they too, with CKD4 or 5 disease, three quarters of whom were on hemodialysis, experienced 95 five plus rates of sustained response with a 12 week regimen in, in genotype 1 infected patients. So we are seeing uh, across the board improvements in outcomes of, of, of all our patients. And, and, and now, in the face of DAAs becoming standard of care, uh, our, our, our newest unmet group, need group is really those very few patients who have failed these DAA regimens. And so it turns out that these uh, refugees, if you will, um, can be offered uh, yet another regimen. This is combining yet a, a third class 
a protease inhibitor to the nuke and the NS5A inhibitor. So fosbuvir, felpatasvir plus voxelaprovir, sofelvox. And in this instance, these were patients who were either treated with, with protease-based regimens, NS5A-based regimens, so phosphor-based regimens, and uh, across genotypes shown here on the x-axis. And you can see here that the sustained response rates overall were 97% in DAA failures. So we even have essentially a rescue therapy for those patients who are, who are failures of the more modern DAA regimens. So, so with a triumph in the science of, of, of the virology of hepatitis C, the real question then becomes, how do we uh, you know, eliminate the epidemic? Well, part of the problem has always been case finding. And, the, uh, and I want to just say that the CDC recommendations that emanated back to 20 years ago, which were risk factor based uh, screening uh, approaches, were an abject failure. They failed to, to, to detect new cases of hepatitis C, uh, probably on the basis of faulty recall, uh, willing uh, uh, inability to recall, um, uh, and certainly unwillingness of the clinicians to ask in this instance. So this was not going to cut it. And so in the 2012, with the impending introduction of DAAs, CDC uh, retooled and said, let's go, let's go and find the epidemic where it resides. And, that's, and that it was principally in the, in the boomer cohort of patients born between 1945 and 65, 80% of whom um, uh, is, is uh, 80% of the epidemic residing in this group of patients. So the recommendation came for single time screening. It was reimbursable um, and was expected to identify up to a million new prevalent cases of hepatitis C. That has been uh, a very modest success. Uh, we, we still have not deeply penetrated into, that, into those one million cases. The penetration of screening is still variable, uh, but, but certainly we have, we have uncovered new cases as a result of it. The other revolution in managing patients has, has really been uh, staging them uh, uh, um, because it's very important for us with chronic hepatitis C patients to understand that yes, it's an infectious disease, but it is at its heart a liver disease. We need to understand how much liver disease these patients have. And what it used to be, we would, we, would, uh, we would recommend biopsies. But it turns out we now have developed uh, sufficient non-invasive uh, screening strategies, be they serum-based or imaging-based, to uh, accurately uh, uh, cluster or, or divide our patients between uh, cirrhotic or advanced fibrotic versus non-advanced fibrosis. One of those is called uh, transient elastography, otherwise known as FibroScan. It is an ultrasound-based technique which assesses the stiffness of the organ being interrogated, in this case, the liver. It correlates well with fibrosis and is a quantitative continuous variable so it, and, and has no real ceiling so that you can have a, male, a, a, a stiffness score of 13 or 14, which equates with cirrhosis, but that score can go up to 75. So with advancing uh, uh, stiffness, we see portal hypertension, we see the risk for HCC also going up in that context. Very easy to use, risk-free, minimal training involved, takes about 10 minutes for our patients. And we can really divide out the F4 patients shown here, the cirrhotics, from the rest of the group of non-cirrhotics with, with, with pretty good separation between those groups. And, and this is really what it's intended to do, because once you've identified a cirrhotic that has implications for selection of regimen, duration of regimen, and what you need to do with that patient moving forward, i.e. liver cancer screening, as well as variceal or portal hypertension screening, right? So any cautions in terms of the use of, of DAAs? Well, there are some cautions. So uh, um, I want to point your attention to in the early years after the introduction of DAAs, there, there were at least from one center in Spain, there were cases of, of those patients who had a diagnosis of HCC who then experienced recurrence uh, in the first year after being treated with DAAs for their hepatitis C. Uh, and so, so a cautionary tale was, was uh, note was raised by, by the center saying, are we in fact triggering or, or unleashing a recurrence of HCC? Uh, another study from Italy suggested a difference in the quality of the HCC, uh, that, that maybe they were more multinodular, more infiltrative in about half of cases. But there have been a, a slew of studies that have been conducted since those initial reports. And those studies uh, uh, absolutely do not suggest a re recurrence or occurrence of de novo HCC in excess of rates that were previously observed in the days of interferon-based therapy. Indeed, a meta-analysis of over 40 studies encompassing nearly 14,000 patients showed no difference after adjustment for study follow-up and, and age. In fact, uh, it, it, may, it may just be that, that, that the, the HCCs described in patients uh, more recently with DAAs relates to the fact that they are older, have longer duration of disease, have uh, higher child Pew scores, lower platelet counts, 
and have higher frequencies of diabetes, all known risk factors for HCC. Those risk factors were more stacked in the DAA population compared to those uh, not on, on DAAs or, or treated historically with interferon. Nonetheless, they do raise the question of, is there an alteration as you clear virus of perhaps tumor surveillance in the context of, of DAAs? Are, you, are we removing at some level immune surveillance of, of, of cancer? Moreover, I think the question can be raised, even though this is not a virus that integrates into the host genome, are there still either epigenetic or transcriptional changes that have been induced by chronic hep C infection that do not fully reverse, even with cure of that infection? Uh, either way, the, these, uh, the, the fact that there is a frequency of, of HCC uh, that, that, it, that occurs after cure uh, I think reminds us that we must continue to screen those patients with advanced fibrosis for HCC thereafter. And in fact, uh, we do not know, and we're going to need further study on this, when we can ever relax that screening in these patients. Uh, we are clearly seeing reductions in, in, in rates of HCC as we move f uh, further out from an SVR, but they are not, they have not yet moved to zero. So we need to continue the vigilance for, for monitoring these patients. I want to share with you just some data from um, a collaboration that we had with Eugen Hoshida, uh, who was formerly at Mount Sinai, now at, at University of Texas uh, Southwestern. And basically, uh, we did a study of biopsies of patients um, with all variety of etiologies shown here, hep C, hep B, alcohol, and, and fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and, and, and Eugen developed a gene signature looking at, at a number of genes whose expression was either uh, uh, in a high-risk group of genes was upregulated, shown here in red, or, or low-risk genes that were downregulated in persons who were at high risk for subsequent development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, similarly, uh, these were low-risk, uh, with the inverted pattern, those persons were deemed low-risk. And if you've looked at these, these were, these were transcriptional patterns uh, of 32 genes based on uh, a liver biopsy that was obtained um, um, uh, in these patients uh, in, in, in a cross-sectional manner. If you looked at the outcome of these patients, they're probably HCC. It was directly related to their, to their score. High-risk patients having the highest risk for HCC development compared to the low-risk group with a corresponding uh, inversion in, in mortality. Uh, when you looked at all etiologies and the, and the hazard ratio of a, of a poor prognostic signature for the development of HCC, uh, that was uh, anywhere from three to tenfold, shown here on a log scale, uh, in excess um, uh, in terms of, of, in excess of controls when it came to the subsequent development or risk for HCC. But interestingly, what I want to share with you is there were a number of patients who had paired biopsies, who had hep C. Uh, the paired biopsies, the second biopsy occurring after SVR, after this, the cure had been obtained. And what you'll notice here is that it's a limited number of patients, about 30, and, and, and then um, a, a, the variable events, sustained response, non-response, cancer development or no cancer development. But you'll see here, in those patients who went on to develop cancer, shown here in the first and third bars, there was an incomplete uh, reduction or improvement in the expression of the high-risk genes and an incomplete enhancement of expression of the low-risk genes in these patients, which suggests that, that we are, even with cure virus, in some patients, incompletely reverting their signature back to a normal risk or low risk uh, signature. So it may very well be that we need to think about these kinds of tools to assess residual risk for the development of, of uh, adverse outcomes like uh, HCC. The other, I think, cautionary tale in, in managing our patients is that of, of reactivation of coexisting hepatitis B. Remember the hep B and hep C as bloodborne pathogens do travel together in many instances. So it's very important for us to, uh, to be sure we understand the HPV status of our patients. And that was prompted by a report from the FDA a number of years ago of, of two dozen cases of HPV reactivation in the context of SBR achieved using DAA therapy. All but two of these cases were surface antigen positive at baseline. Three of these cases went on to develop fulminant hepatic failure. One, interestingly enough, was, was only anti-core positive at baseline. Two of these led to death and one required liver transplantation. In general, these things, these events occurred during treatment, during weeks four through 12 of therapy with, with DAAs. But, but in actuality, we really don't know the precise frequency because we haven't been monitoring this in most of our patients of, of, of a reactivation event. Uh, but it does raise the question as to whether there's a competitive relationship between these viruses. Bringing one virus down, uh, enhancing uh, the availability of replication space for the other infection, uh, uh, but also the alteration potentially of the immune milieu following uh, successful treatment with DAAs. We, we uh, speculate that potentially what might be going on here is that 
In the context of hep C, this, this is a co-infected scenario, and this is the HPV mono-infected scenario. When you are co-infected with hep C, there is an induction of, of the host type 1 interferon response, an induction of interferon-stimulated genes, which by virtue of, of the subversion of hep C of that response, doesn't clear C, but may have a containment effect on hepatitis B. So in the context of clearance of hep C, then, that induction of ISGs may be uh, 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 drilled down or, or dialed down, in which case that containment of B may be lost, in which case hep B now is free uh, to potentially uh, replicate. Uh, so this, uh, among other uh, hypotheses, uh, is being tested, but, but, but is an intriguing to sort of make us think about, about this competitive relationship between infections. So the, the FDA recommends that we should, of course, assess hep B status in each and every one of our patients who is about to embark on a course of DAAs, and that patients who have serologic evidence of HPV, whether it's surface antigen positivity or anti-core positivity, um, or both, should be followed actively during and after DAA therapy, and, and particularly with HPV DNA levels, uh, because they rise first before ALT levels do. And antiviral therapy for B should be initiated uh, for hep B as, as uh, warranted based on those patterns. But I do want to say that we now have early returns, now that we're four or five years into the DAA era, about clinical outcomes. Uh, and this is a, one of, of uh, no doubt, many studies that will soon roll out demonstrating that there is clinical benefit. I already showed you there was benefit for decompensated patients who are falling off the cliff in terms of the stabilization of their status. But it also turns out that even non-serotic patients uh, have measurable or demonstrable benefit even in, with this uh, relatively brief of follow-up. This was a study from the U.S. Veterans Administration of patients with gene touch 1 through 3 hep C who had uh, scores, non-invasive scores for fibrosis that put them in the non-serotic range. Their FIB4 scores were less than 3.25. About 40,000 of them were treated with DAAs with a corresponding expected success rate of about 97%. Uh, and so uh, those patients uh, who experienced SVR over the over 100 person years were 1.18 deaths compared to the no SVR group where there were 2.84 deaths um, and untreated patients um, who may reflect other biases uh, had an even higher rate of deaths over that period of time. Uh, after adjustment, adjustment for other factors contributing to mortality, uh, the hazard ratio was reduced by about uh, uh, a little over twofold uh, for sustained responders compared to those who did not achieve sustained response. So mortality benefit, even in non-serotic uh, non patients, appears to be uh, um, um, visible uh, in the years uh, following successful cure with DAAs. So to summarize, an all oral Tolerable, uh, uh, high-efficacy regimens with better than 95% cure rates are now the standard of care for hep C. And there are many different roads to the same interferon-free uh, destination, which is great news for us all. Uh, high sustained rates, are, uh, virologic response rates, are now possible in historically difficult-to-treat populations, including cirrhotic patients, decompensated patients, post-liver uh, transplant patients. Data I didn't share with you also shows that that group does very well. HIV co-infected patients. And, and, and we should take pause to just, you know, it, you know really to take stock of the fact that this is, represents the first cure of a chronic infection in human beings, uh, which is truly, I think, uh, a dramatic fact. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but essentially, the, these are, this is our strategy, our roadmap for treating gene type 1 through 4, uh, as issued by the ASLD IDSA group that uh, John uh, is, is uh, in an intimate part of, uh, and I had the chance to be a part of for, for some time. Um, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this. This is, but this is basically, uh, these are, are regimens that can bring about these very high rates of response uh, across uh, the major uh, genotypes. But ideally, all patients should be treated um, uh, because all patients can experience clinical benefit. We have seen extra hepatic improvements in terms of cardiovascular and renal improvements in patients. Even some non-hepatic malignancies are reduced in the context of HCV cure. So we're not just seeing hepatic uh, mortality or, or morbidity uh, improvements. For those with advanced fibrosis, I'll remind you again, don't forget to keep screening for HCC because of the residual, albeit diminished, there is still a residual risk. And, and don't forget to assess HPV status in those patients. This is the hcvguidelines.org page, which should be your Bible for managing these patients should you choose to do so. Uh, it is uh, extremely user-friendly. It actually comes in a downloadable form that you can put onto your, your mobile phone. Um, but is, is menu driven. You pick your genotype, you pick your, your, uh, your prior treatment situation, you pick their, your, your, your uh, serotic state, and then you click uh, the corresponding bar and a set of recommendations with uh, supporting literature will emerge uh, for each of those patient 
scenario. So we think this should be very user-friendly for, for each of you, and this is updated continuously given the rapidly changing environment. So what are the remaining challenges in terms of uh, treating, of, of dealing with hep C now that in many ways the virological science has been solved? Uh, our challenge is now elimination. The World Health Organization and the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Medicine, and Engineering have issued uh, an edict that we shall uh, a pledge to attempt uh, elimination of hep C by 2030. Uh, and, and that would translate into a 90% reduction in new chronic infection cases and a 65% reduction in corresponding uh, mortality. But in order to get there, we need a ton of work in terms of linking our patients to care. Uh, access of direct acting virus still remains problematic. Uh, restrictions uh, by payers uh, to DAAs in the U.S. still remain a problem. One recent study from Philadelphia uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, that 52% of private payers and 34% of Medicaid payers still restrict based on fibrosis stage, which is really at this juncture indefensible. So the meds are also not getting to those who need them most, namely those who are still at active risk of acquiring infection. And this refers to uh, new groups of patients who are spiking with uh, acute infection with hepatitis C, namely persons who inject drugs. And this is uh, most represented by those uh, converting to heroin after uh, uh, addiction to uh, prescription opioids. This has been a major problem in, in so many pockets of, of the country. Uh, and, and indeed, incident cases of acute hepatitis C still exceed the number of cures we're getting today. So the actual epidemic on balance is, is, is rising, not falling here in the, in, the, in the US. And so we still have problems. There have been a number of successful strategies to micro-eliminate the disease in a number of countries, notably in Europe, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Spain, and France, all have had uh, uh, successful or, uh, or in, in the progress of successful uh, strategies to eliminate uh, uh, hep C based on, on, uh, uh, on um, uh, extensive screening and linkage to care campaigns. Uh, and uh, I know those efforts are underway here at University of Washington, uh, uh, led by John and others. Um, and and, and this is, um, this, th these, I think, abode well for our opportunity to actually accomplish uh, this task. Clearly, uh, even though we have cures, we still need a protective vaccine to prevent transmission. There are ongoing trials. This is a, uh, this is, they're not great neutralizing antibodies, but there have been approaches to look at T-cell uh, 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 centered vaccines uh, uh, that are ongoing in injection uh, drug users. And I'll close by saying that there's, there are new opportunities perhaps raised by the success of DAAs, and one of them is actually uh, in the realm of organ transplantation, where I have uh, uh, one of my hats is, is, to, is to manage liver transplant patients. Uh, and here we've had the opportunity to take infected organs, many from those donors who were victims of opioid overdoses, um, uh, and to transplant them not just into uh, recipients infected with hep C, but also recipients who are uninfected with hep C because of the extraordinarily long wait list for organs in this country. And this is a conceivable, previously inconceivable notion, but now a conceivable one. And, and the proof of concept came from a kidney transplant experience uh, at, in, in Philadelphia where 20 patients were treated day, on the third day after kidney transplantation from an RNA positive kidney transplant donor into uninfected recipients given a genotype 1 regimen, um, these are genotype 1 infected kidneys, with albospheric rosapavir, which can be given in patients with a diminished renal function. All achieved sustained response with a preservation of quality of life and excellent outcomes at 12 months. So there is a proof of concept that we can pull this off. Uh, and this can be done certainly in other organ transplants, heart, lung, and liver, especially with the availability of pangenotypic regimens uh, and, uh, and really the preemptive use of these, these treatments well before a clinical illness or infection uh, develop in these patients. And um, if I have time, uh, maybe just to share with you to, just what we're doing with some of our heart transplant patients. We are offering them glucaprovir pibrenosphere for eight weeks immediately after receipt or on call to the OR for a heart transplant, um, and then monitoring them uh, thereafter for uh, achievement of clearance of hepatitis C. Uh, Sixteen of these patients have, have been treated, although I, we've done five more recently, so it's a total of 21. Um, who, have, who have been treated with HCV-infected hearts. I will note that most of these patients were long-term inpatients who had been in the hospital for 30 days or longer uh, with immediate life-threatening conditions requiring VAD devices, LVADs, uh, BIVADs, um, among others. Uh, so these were extremely sick patients who, who weren't getting offers. All achieved viral suppression by day nine. All RNAs thereafter have been undetectable. There have been no important drug interactions requiring 
cessation of therapy or alteration of immunosuppressants for that matter. Uh, and so far, survival has been, ex uh, been 100% over about 1,600 days of follow-up, and all that were transplanted prior to May, we started this in November of 2017, have achieved a sustained uh, response. And perhaps the most striking thing is, is the wait list of patients before the protocol, shown here. Uh, the standard wait list of uh, wait time was 113 days. After uh, consent to the HCV protocol, their wait time dropped to 11 days. Um, so. Um, we're, it's, we're really able to move the needle in these patients in terms of being able to offer them life-saving, in this case, life-saving uh, uh, transplant. So I'll stop there and thank you uh, for your, your attention and thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to, um, to give this talk. <laughs>